okay, there's probably some other people still uh, coming in from the, the invite list, but we're a couple of minutes over 11, so we'll start to get into it. What we have very fortunately today is a, a masterclass, if you like, over a couple of hours on decision-making in a complex world by uh, Dave. Actually, before I give more details to Dave, uh, if anything goes wrong, we uh, go out that door and through the door there and down to the south end of James Over. And toilets are through that door too, so that's our strategy. Uh, back onto Dave. So uh, I've known Dave for a long time now. Dave started doing his PhD in supervised learning, give or take. Unsupervised. Unsupervised learning, there you go. At Bristol University, under the cook Professor Collins, he then did some lecturing in Oxford. He then jumped out of the fire and into the frying pan and came down with me to UNSW. We were both postdocs for a while. Talking about 2005, then we went back to the professorship at Bristol. Yep. And then from Bristol, we went back to become a professor at Lancaster University in uh, statistical learning and all such things like that. He does lots of stuff on decision making we're going to hear about today. He was the head of the maths department there for a while, but I think relieved that he is no longer doing his own work again. And he's going to be talking to us for a couple of hours today um, on decision making in a complex world. Uh, and lunch is at the end of it. So thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you take that one, so I don't drink your water. No idea what you might catch from that. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for donating your time. Let me just dump that there. So, yeah, as I'd said, uh, I'm at Lancaster University. I've got a couple of things just introducing me and introducing Lancaster, and then we'll launch into uh, some thinking on decision making uh, largely. Um, so, yeah, Ed's kind of done this already. Uh, so, I'm professor at Lancaster. Been there 10 years now. It's been a fast 10 years. It's a fun 10 years. It's a good place. Uh, I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, uh, yeah, so in that time we've been um, co-PI on a, well, before I came to Lancaster and doing uh, was co-PI on a big decision-making in an unstable world project that was mathematicians, statisticians, computer scientists and psychologists all working together to think about how humans and machines should make decisions. Uh, one of the other co eyes on that one is Simon Fowle, who's in the psychology department here. So I'm going to go catch up with Simon tomorrow. Um, uh, since being in Lancaster as PI of this data science and the natural environment project, this is how do we make sense of environmental data, make better decisions around about that. Uh, lots of Gaussian processes. Uh, the stats people here will be very pleased to hear. Uh, uh, and large scale computing and satellite data and all that kind of governs. And so a nice range of things going on there. Um, I've also spent some time you know, dabbling in startup world. Um, I never jumped shit from academia. I quite like my nice monthly salary. So I've not had the guts to jump completely, but it, uh, there was some fun to be had there. And I'm on the scientific board of this company called the Smith Institute, um, who are a national mathematical consultancy company in the UK, who basically consults to end you say that I've got a problem, I think maths might be useful for it, can you help? Um, they do stuff on uh, nuclear decommissioning because they model the degradation of, of bricks and when do we need to replace those bricks? And then you need the, the kind of maths to extrapolate the modeling out for that. And so that's fun. I get involved in some of the um, scientific thinking of that. So that, that's how I spend my time. As I said, I was head of stats at Lancaster for five years. Uh, I didn't have much time to spend on anything else during that time. Uh, but now I've escaped. And so I'm here having fun again. Uh, and by having fun, I mean doing good stats. Just before I launch into the, the rest of the, the, uh, the project, uh, the, the talk. So this is... Uh, some of the exciting things going on at Lancaster at the moment. So Lancaster uh, is a relatively small university in the northwest of England. Uh, we have a really good mathematical sciences department. And our unique selling point in the, in the context of the UK is that we really care about making our research useful to the world. Okay, so we, we spend a lot of time going, okay, that's all very nice, good sums, what's it for? And, and that, that's our key thing. Um, we run the STORY CDT, Statistics and Operations Research uh, Supporting Industry. Uh, which is about 50 PhD students at any one time, all looking at statistics and operations research. We're here as one of the students from that, um, and part funded by Tide as well. Uh, the most recent stuff we've got is this expansion into an applied math section. We're not doing a traditional applied math section, though we're going for math of AI and real world systems. Um, so my first job when I get back from this trip is to do three whole days of interviews for lecturers, senior lecturers and professors. 
I suspect we won't fill all the posts, and so there are posts still available if anybody's interested in coming being part of this. Um, uh, and there's also going to be postdoc positions coming quite soon. So any students looking for postdocs, uh, give me a shout after the talk and we can have a chat. Um, and we've also recently been granted the 10 million quid to build the probabilistic AI research hub. So the UK has suddenly funded about five of these uh, and we're hosting one, which is all the kind of the probability and statistical end of AI. Uh, how can we do the computations needed to do AI? How can we think about AI tools in the context of uh, random data and things? And that's also recruiting postdocs and PhDs. So that, they're the, the standard ad, uh, job adverts sent out there. We, we struggle in the UK to find people who can do good statistical research in AI. So if you're looking for jobs and you can put up with a bit of bad weather, uh, UK is a good place to come and do your next position. So good. Uh, and then introduction at last to the masterclass. So this is what we're going to be covering today. I'll go over some core decision theory, uh, key concepts. These is perhaps more from the perspective of an economics or psychology uh, take on decision theory. Uh, that's where much of the, the kind of fundamental work in decision theory comes from. Um, but of course, with a stats spin on it, because that's what I do. Um, so my, my research career has kind of drifted between disciplines. I, I kind of did maths undergrad, and then my PhD was in a maths department, but kind of doing economics and computer science. It's all game theory and reinforcement learning. Uh, then I came to uh, Australia and started actually doing statistics, but in an economics department. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so and then some psychology and various bits and pieces. So I'm very much in between disciplines. Uh, and so that's why I can, I, well, I like to think I can credibly talk about the decision theory stuff. Um, then some sequential decision making, get some ideas going there. And then a bit of a deeper dive at the end into Bayesian optimization, because I think it's a really useful tool for what Tide's trying to achieve. Uh, and uh, it's also what I haven't had some slides lying around on when I was asked to give this uh, masterclass. So double double reason for that being there. Okay, um, first question. Why do you care about statistics? Why should we care about doing statistics? What do you think? You know, wh why do you actually ever go and put some data in and try and build a model and do statistical inference? What, anyone? Because it's real? Because you want to get your paper published by the journal editor? You need to get a p-value out? Uh, perhaps in this project, it's the only way to get Ed to shut up, as if you go and do some stats, right? So, um, um, But really, so here's what I think. Is the, it's to understand the world, right? You need to kind of take some data and do some inference to understand what's going on out there. Why do we care about understanding what's going on out there? I mean, not just in a scientific sense, generally. Why do we care about what's going on? Oh, you might want to make some predictions about what might happen tomorrow. Why do predictions matter? That rock sitting on a beach doesn't care about predicting what's going to happen tomorrow because they can't do anything to change it anyway. We care about making predictions because we want to make decisions. Okay, so uh, I've spent much of my career saying, okay, you know, all the stats is very well. You get a p-value, you get a posterior, you might even get a prediction, but why do we care about that? It's about making the decision. And so when you're doing the inference, you should care about, is this inference improving my decision-making capability or is it just for the sake of it? I think that's a really crucial thing that's kind of forgotten in much of modern stats. If you go back to, so when I was in Oxford, we had a day of strikes. Now, why was that? Oh, the, the, the kind of every five years we have a pension crisis in UK academia. We all go on strike for a couple of weeks. We lose a lot of salary. We get a slightly better pension and then we carry on. Um, and so it turns out there were only two academics on strike in the Department of Statistics. One was David Cox, fellow of the Royal Society, Sir Professor, whatever, all the accolades. And the other was me, the, the kind of most junior temporary lecturer in the place. So he had me in for lunch and told me all sorts of exciting stories, uh, as, as happens when you meet someone of that sort of stature. And we, you know, he said, look, all this modern statistics, you've got to remember, it's, it's kind of all got very mathematical, not very interesting. When they were developing the stats originally, they wanted to make sure they could grow enough potatoes to keep the UK alive just after the Second World War. They were design all of their theoretical experimental design was very focused on how can we decide which uh, varieties of potatoes to grow where to grow them and what fertilizers to put on them to make sure they had enough food. So it was all very focused on the decision making at the start. And then it kind of evolved out and got rather more mathematical. And, you know, mathematical stats departments now, they often don't really care what it's for. They just want to get a theorem out. And I really don't like that kind of stats. We've got a joke in Lancaster that if you're publishing in the Annals of Statistics, we don't want you in the Lancaster Maths Department because it's all about proving the theory. Okay, and so this is very much where I come from. Um, so then what's decision theory for? 
Okay, so if stats was to make good decisions, you'd understand how to use your influence to make good decisions. Okay, it's all very well having all your influence and you say this is for making a decision. If you don't know how to translate those beliefs into a good action, then you've, there's a disconnect in the middle. And that's kind of what we're at today, is how do we connect the, the influence with the decision making and, and get good things to happen. With me so far? Good. Right. Well, if you're making a decision, just pick the best one, right? So suppose we're in a world where you can put a value on everything, okay? You've got three identical options and they've got different prices on them. You pick the one with the smallest price, okay? You've got the good, the bad, the better, the best, whatever on these slides I put up. Um, and so if you can put a value on things and you know the value of those things, then there really isn't a difficult problem here, except often there is, uh, if your decisions are actually really complicated. If you've got a big logistics problem, you want to do something really hard, the decision making is still really difficult. Okay? Even if you can put a value on every plausible decision you might have, it's not an easy thing to do. You might want to be, you know, in a mathematical sense, optimizing some big complicated function of a high dimension. Yeah, well, that's not easy. You might want to be solving some of these big uh, engineering challenges, and you can say, what's the value of this structure? But actually, it's still hard to optimize. And so we're not really looking at that today. Okay, games like Go, you can solve them in theory. That's difficult to do. That's not what we're about today. Um, that's operations research, largely. And more, more, more recently, AI uh, claims to do many of the things that operations research have been claiming to do for decades, but AI is more trendy, so it gets all the buzzwords. But operations research and AI is how you find the best action given some fixed beliefs, largely. Uh, so not much more on that. Now let's talk about known randomness. Okay, so there's different kinds of randomness, different kinds of uncertainties going on. And that's an important bit for this bit of early section of the talk, talking about these things. So here we have a roulette wheel, uh, and a very cool roulette player, but anyway, that's another issue. Uh, we've got a roulette wheel, and so you know the distribution of what's going to happen. Okay, unless it's a rigged wheel, let's assume it's not. You know what's going on. You know, this is why we teach undergraduate probability by rolling dice, picking cards, all this kind of stuff. You can understand the distribution you're playing with. You can take calculations uh, based on these distributions. So this is where the notation that we're going to be using to kind of explain things are coming in. I am a mathematician. There is notation. Uh, I won't apologize for it. I think it's the best way to understand this stuff. Hopefully, it's not going to be too complicated, except for the one slide that will take about five minutes explaining the notation. Okay. Um, so you, you choose something you're going to do. I'm going to bet on red. Then an experiment happens, and something random happens, as that's the number your roulette ball lands on. But you could have known in advance what the distribution of those things were. And then, based on the action you took and the outcome, you get a reward. You, know, you either get double your money or nothing in roulette. Okay? Uh, and then, what you want to do in this world is maximize the expected utility of your decision. Okay, so there's various options. Uh, you could bet on well, in roulette, it's actually a really bad example here, right? Because the expected rewards always zero or just under zero in roulette, so it's not particularly important. But uh, um, you want to, uh, you can take the expectation over the possible outcomes. And you can calculate that if you know the distribution of the outcomes, and you want to take the expected utility, and then choose the action that maximizes that. So this is a relatively simple framework still. Um, I'm mentioning this term utility here. We'll get back to that, okay? Uh, yeah. If it doesn't utility, then a very like uh, intangible, like personal. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Uh, you're exactly right. So it's very easy when you start thinking about this stuff uh, in a financial sense to call it okay the financial benefit, but actually it's much more complicated than that. So we'll get there. Let's think about Pascal's wager. Who's seen Pascal's wager before? Quite a few. Okay, so Pascal used this as a way to justify whether or not you should believe in God. Okay, and he used it to conclude, yes, you should believe in God. I've changed it to be slightly less contentious and use exactly the same argument to argue that you should always wear garlic around your neck. Okay, so uh, you're going to choose an action. You're either going to wear garlic around your neck or you're going to smell okay. You know, this is always a bit present in a maths department, right? Because often the smell okay is a bit contentious, but at least you're not going to have garlic around your neck. Um, so... And then the two outcomes of the world 
are that either vampires exist or vampires don't, right? And everybody knows that if you've got garlic around your neck, then you're protected from vampires, okay? And so if you were gar garlic, so then if, let's say we have a known distribution over the outcomes. So this is the world I was talking about. In the roulette wheel, you, the ball lands on a, on a number and you, you get a, an outcome that way. In this world, let's say we can posit any distribution over my two outcomes. Vampires exist with some probability, vampires don't exist with one minus that probability. And so the expected utility for wearing garlic is some small probability times this number plus some probability times this number. Okay, it's a finite negative quantity. Okay, there's a cost from the garlic, G, and there's a cost uh, for living with vampires. Okay, let's see, but it's not a big cost. It's finite. If you don't wear garlic, then the probability that vampires exist multiplied by the infinite cost of being eternal damnation or whatever happens when you meet a vampire without garlic uh, is added to zero times the probability that no vampires. And so your expected utility for wearing garlic is always higher than your expected utility for smelling okay, because this is finite and this thing's infinite. So therefore, you should all be wearing garlic if you think there's any possibility at all that vampires exist. Okay, so that's a, it's a classic uh, example of decisions coming into play. Um, of course, why don't we wear garlic? There's only two possible reasons here. One is that you put zero probability on this column, and the other is that it's not infinitely bad if you get bitten by a vampire. I don't know which one it is for you. Yeah, we've got subjectivity on this, but I don't see any of you wearing garlic. So, uh, let me just modify the, the headings of the columns a little bit. I suppose we're deciding whether to go and inspect a bit of infrastructure out in the ocean. Okay? Um, you can either inspect it, and your cost of inspection is G, uh, and if you've got to fix it, you incur a cost C. Or you can choose not to inspect it, with no cost, but if it fails, it's infinitely bad. Okay, by the same argument as before, you should always inspect. Unless your cost of inspection is infinite, um, or you don't think it's infinitely bad if the thing fails. Okay, so I, 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 I posit that this infinity is not actually what it happens in the decision-making process on whether or not to inspect something. But, you know, you can use the same sort of thinking to decide on all sorts of operational decisions. Should I go and do that? What's the expected thing? And the important thing is these are utilities, not costs, exactly as you said. Okay, so the actual cost of this thing blowing up, well, it's a, it's a finite amount of money, but is that actually a utility of this thing blowing up? Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that one in there. Right. With that introduction, it's now up to you to do some work. Okay? People on this side of the room, I want you to chat with whoever near you and discuss example A here and decide what you would do. This side of the room, of course, is doing example B. So have a chat with each other, work out what you want to do, and decide. So example A, you've been pulled in by the state. They've hauled you over the coals. You've done something they don't like. Um, they say, well, to be honest, we can make this go away. Pay us $750,000. It'll be the end of the day. Uh, uh, and we can just move on. Or you can argue this fact. And it's going to go to trial, but it's going to be in a toss of a coin whether or not you get away with this. Okay, you've got 50% chance of uh, getting off scot-free. No cost at all. Um, or 50% chance of taking the same fine, but also you've got now legal costs on another $250,000. Okay, so that, that's you guys' problem. You've got to work out what you want to do. This side, you built a fabulous data science consultant. You spawn off out of the university. You've said, okay, we've got this real great stuff to do. And someone comes along, a venture capitalist says, well, I can just buy that from you now. Uh, I know that's not what it is. They're not often to buy, they're often to support. That's what these VCs do, right? They don't actually just buy it off you and make your life easy. They say, right, we'll support your company. Uh, if you accept, there's a 50, 50 chance that down the line you'll sell it for a million dollars. But of course, you might lose it for everything. So you could keep your $250,000, sell the company, or you could take the, the gamble for the future. Okay, so that's you guys' problem. Have a chat with each other. Work out what you want to do in, in these examples. Okay, should we, should we come back? So, uh, 
Right, so on this side, can you stick your hands up if you would just accept the fine? Nobody's accepting fine. Oh my, my, good on you. And so everyone else would take the gamble of going to court, would you? Okay, explain your reasoning. Anyone? Go on, Mike. I'm, I'm risk averse and I'd rather take a certain outcome than not take an outcome. So you prefer to take the $750,000 fine? Well, yeah. You wouldn't, so the you wouldn't take that coin toss of getting away to zero? Yeah, <laughs> my money, right? uh, correct, okay. Uh, so, so that one, but, but generally, you would, you would gamble, would you? Yeah, and you guys would all gamble. So Mike, Mike's out in the lane, but that's not very surprising to anyone. So it's a... Okay, what about this side? Um, who, who would sell for $250,000? Quite a few of you. Who would gamble? <laughs> Project manager. Yeah, that's the way to go. Uh, okay, um, again, what's the reasoning? For those of you who chose to keep the 250 what's the reasoning for sticking to that? Risk averse. You want to keep your money. Yeah. Um, and those who want to gamble? Worth, worth a quack. Yeah. So, uh, right, so I, I'm sure those of you did the expected utility and did the calculation will have noticed they're basically the same structure. Yeah. So you basically go up. You, from where you start the, the problem at $750,000, you either uh, accept zero or you say, I'm going to gamble and, and uh, I'm going to be uh, better off. Basically, an expectation $250,000 better off over here. And most people take that gamble. Okay, Over here, um, you've got your 250000 and you can gamble and you might be £250,000 better off an expectation, but you, your loss might be 250000 as well. Okay, And so usually what we see is what the majority of people voted with. Okay, So most people would say, well, from 750,000 down, I'll just gamble. The difference between 750,000 and a million isn't very much really when it comes down to it. I'm bankrupt anyway. And so, and so I might as well take the gamble on getting off stock free. On this side, if you've got 250,000, that's a lot more than most of us have in the bank account, right? And so risking losing all that is, is really not a great idea. Uh, and so often you, you would not see gambling going on over here because it's probably not worth it. Uh, and so these are, this shows us, though, that you get these different instincts of what to do, uh, that actually the money value isn't everything. We value things differently. Okay, but, you know, I deliberately brought up the idea that the difference between losing 750000 and losing a million isn't so very different. They, they have enormous effects on your, on your solvency. The difference between having nothing and having 250000 is quite a big thing. You, know, it's, it's, you can buy a house at that point. Uh, and so that, that's a huge uh, difference in a reference point at the start. And so you get different feelings about uh, what you choose. So this is where we get into the idea of utility, which has already been brought up. And so people value different amounts of money differently. Classically, you see the value of money rising very steeply from zero to a level. But you know, if you're already earning $1,000 a day, getting an extra $10 you know, doesn't matter very much. But if you're earning nothing a day, then earning ten dollars a day means you can feed yourself. Or well, maybe not right here. But anyway, you, know, you can get it, so you get different values of utility as you go along. And this is uh, known as subjective expected utility. Actually, different people value things differently. Phil's quite happy to gamble two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. Many of you are not. Uh, the life stage going on here, maybe. <laughs> um, but uh, everybody's got different utility functions. Uh, and then the question goes, well, how does this all work? How do you fit all of this together, what goes on? And these guys, um, well, I said actually this is economics and, and psychology, but these guys were all very much mathematicians. Right? So von Neumann was uh, part of the Rand Corporation uh, during the, and after the Second World War. He was a, uh, did a lot of game theory work. Morgan Stern is also a game theorist. He was Hungarian, I think, and von Neumann originally as well. Uh, and they did lots of work uh, thinking about human choice uh, von Neumann did a lot of work modeling the Cold War, actually. He was very keen on mutual assured destruction, which maybe not the best thing to be keen on, but he, he understood the need for it in his take on it anyway. And then Lenny Savage there is a Bayesian, uh, Bayesian statistician, really, uh, but philosopher, philosopher as well, I guess. Uh, and so what they said, well, if there are these things about choice that we believe to be true, then the consequence of that 
is that any individual will behave as if they are maximizing their expected utility, where utility is some hidden function of the value of money or the value of the outcome. So each outcome has a utility and we'd never see that, but individuals act as if they're doing this. And that gives you a framework in which you can start analyzing people's decisions and trying to infer what the utility functions are. It's all based on the idea of lotteries. Okay, so if I offered you this surefire thing or this gamble between two different things, um, which would you choose? And you can do all sorts of experiments to work this out. Yeah, Phil. There's a question. I don't know if you're going to get to that. This is all personal utility. Yes. But if I'm a job, yeah. the utility I'm playing with is someone else's utility. Like they, they come, so, so there could be a divergence between my decision, so my decision yeah. to both from keeping my job. Yes. Maybe I'll be aligned with the utility that's associated with the company, is that? Yeah, interesting. Um, so there are psychologists who spent a lot of time thinking about this kind of thing. I think we best would think about it. But yeah, you're quite right. So the perfect employee will take decisions with the company's utility function, but nobody's that. <laughs> Everybody cares about keeping the job or doing the right thing or whatever, whatever motivates them. And so I imagine this, well, if I was a company and cared about this kind of thing and I worked in a management school, I would be working at how can I try and make sure my employees' utilities align nicely with the company's utilities. I don't think anyone thinks enough about that, probably. Uh, universities certainly don't. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there's all sorts of interesting things to be looked at. But yeah, so, so just to kind of give you some idea of what the axioms are, is you've got completeness. So given two options, you can always choose between them. Uh, transitivity, this is often contentious. So if I prefer B to A and I prefer C to B, then I definitely prefer C to A. Okay. That one's contentious because often you get circular decisions happening. Uh, there's, and then there's something about continuity. So I can, given any option, I can kind of find a lottery between any two other options that gives you the same value there. And then uh, what's it, an independence, which is kind of a bit of a weird one. So I'm not going to try and uh, vocalize that one. Uh, so the, the, the kind of reasonable things they might actually apply more to companies than they do to individuals. Uh, and so, yes, each company would probably have a utility function as well, as long as they remain consistent within themselves. But of course, companies make decisions out of various different decision outputs and so might want, well, not be very consistent as a, as a unit. Um, so there's a lot of really nice stuff in here uh, by Zaki Gilboa, Ken Binmore. There's also a psychologist, Ariel Rubenstein, who's done some really nice examples on choice theory. Uh, I forgot to put them in the slides. Uh, I feel bad about that. But anyway, uh, and so this exists as a concept. We can think about it and go with uh, interesting ideas there. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail on that. It gets quite heavy about how it all works, but I thought we had to introduce utility theory at least. As I said, actually, we often think about, you might have seen in some of your undergrad courses, a concave utility function. So you kind of you really care about your early wins and then not much about bigger ones, the differences get smaller. It's the same in the other way. So in, you, you'll have seen probably Kahneman Tversky's prospect theory, and they talk about an S-shaped utility function. So down this end, it also flattens off. By the time you've lost 750,000, that's not so very different to losing a million. Okay, so you get these kind of S-shaped utility functions. Um, I, I often wonder if the, the most successful companies, the most successful individuals, don't have the same flattening off as many others. They seem to always want more. And so it's a, yeah. Okay, so we've done very well so far. We've kind of got, we've had known situations that you've just got to find some difficult way to optimize. We've had aleatoric uncertainty, if you like, so known randomness in the system. Um, but actually, we often don't know the situation we're playing with. It's an unknown world. So we don't know what the randomness, we don't even know what the expectations are on things. And so how can we handle this? Um, and this is basically where stats comes in, in my book. This is what stats is for, is how do we make decisions in this world. Um, and so what do you say is, well, let's take a model of the world, some model class, and we're going to parameterize that by a theta. So in stats, theta is always a parameter of interest. Um, sometimes it's an angle, often it's not. Uh, and so uh, you can learn. You can find the best model in your class or some beliefs over which models are most appropriate for the data that you've seen. And that's the statistical part. 
So you get an estimate, a Peter Hat if you want, so we pick the best, very best model. Or you might want to be more general and say, well, I'm not going to pick a single best model here. I can say, well, this is generally, if I take an action, I've seen that data, what's my distribution over what's going to happen next? That's a more general, uh, non-parametric way of thinking about it. That might involve integrating over all the models of your parameter if you want to be fully Bayesian about it. It could be taking a point estimate and taking that predictor model. It could have no parameters in your model at all. You're just purely uh, uh, non-parametric. And so that might be taking a bootstrap approach to the world. Uh, given data, I'm going to bootstrap and say, well, given that data, the, the future is going to be this, the future is going to be this. Got lots of things to average over to understand what might happen. Uh, and so this is, um, this is an image of a, of a leaflet that we've produced at Lancaster Math and Stats. I said we really care about our impact on the world. And one of those impacts is kind of relevant to Tide, which is quite nice. Uh, this is my work, just to be absolutely clear. This is largely based on work by John Torn on Extreme Value Stats. And he's done lots of work uh, there helping work out, you know, do we need to decommission this field in the North Sea? Uh, and he worked out, so he has been building models of extreme waves in the North Sea, which turns out it's much easier than the Indian Ocean. We, we had a chat earlier on. Uh, and he cares about multivariate extremes. So when do you get large tide and large wind all at the same time? Because that's what puts massive loads on the structures. And so he's, he's worked out how to analyze these things. So that's working out the model for the extremes is essentially working out the theta of your model. And then you make your decisions on the basis of that learned theta. And you know, the action set here is decommission or don't decommission. Uh, and so that's how we've put some of these things in. In fact, we've got some of these leaflets here. I'll throw them out over lunch later and you can have a look at some of the stuff we do. Uh, uh, there's a couple around ocean environments which will be relevant and a couple that are just kind of generally interesting, but you might as well see them anyway because I've brought them all away from Lancaster. So <laughs> I'll lay them on the table. Um, so given this world, actually it's not so very different. Okay, we started by saying... I've got a distribution over action, over outcomes, and I'm going to choose the action to maximize my utility given that. And all I'm saying now is you've got to work out what this distribution is on the basis of data that you've seen. In that sense, nothing's got any harder. I mean, of course, to get actually this distribution on the basis of the data, you've got to do some modeling, you've got to do some stats, that's harder work. But in, philosophically, in terms of decision making, nothing really changes at this point. And this is it, okay, this is the equation. So don't panic, it's not suddenly launching into slide after slide of this. Um, but this is essentially what statistical decision theory is. Okay, so let's break it down what's going on. At the core of it all, I've still got my utility. I've got a utility of X and A. And if I knew in advance what the outcome was going to be, I would just be maximizing that. But the whole point is I don't know what the world's going to do into the future. So then what I'm doing is I'm taking an expectation of that utility. So that's saying I'm saying, okay, what's a, how do I average over the possible future outcomes given what I know, given what I know, what data and action are there here? So that's what's happening there. I've got an expectation. What's a distribution over future outcomes? Well, that's the statistical part. I've worked out what that distribution over future outcomes is conditional on what I know, DNA a data, previous data, and the action that I took. So then, that means that for each action, I can work out what my expected reward is going to be, or my expected utility, and then all I have to do is maximize it. And so that, that's all we have here. Build it up bit by bit. That is statistical decision theory. And then the interesting part comes in when everything gets a bit more complicated than this simple roulette or, or one-off action that we've been talking about now. So... Uh, the action set, so the, the set I'm maximizing over, that could be complicated. It could be temporally extended. I might take an action today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day, and I want to optimize over that full sequence. The state might evolve as a result of my action, so I might have the policy of how I respond to what I see. And so that's when things like reinforcement learning come into play. Can you, uh, dynamic programming, can you learn that whole policy over time? And that's quite tricky. Uh, that's a different field, that, that, that's you know, either computer science or, or operational research. Um, similarly, the, the state you're going to observe, that might be a one-off, what's the biggest wave I'm going to see next year. It might be, 
what's the cause of effects of this environment over the next 10 years? And so you've got to do a much more complicated expectation to work out what's going to happen. What's the expectation over future ocean and weather states over the, over the 10 year period? You know, X can be complicated. The utility, actually, I've kind of glossed over this. Most people don't know their utility functions. Okay, it's really hard, even within yourself, to say, what do I actually prefer here? And there's quite a lot of work out there in the stats community on prior elicitation. So I want to work out what do you believe is likely to happen before you actually see any data. There's a whole thing on prior elicitation, but I've seen much less work on utility elicitation. Uh, so one guy I mentioned already, uh, Ken Binmore, um, he overlapped with me in Bristol for a while. He designed, the, I think it was the world's first, it was certainly the UK's first spectrum option. So they auctioned off a bit of the radio, um, radio frequency spectrum so the, to mobile phone companies. So they can run their networks in it. And he, said, he was an economist, decision theorist, game theorist, said, okay, you tell me what you want to maximize, I'll design you an auction to maximize it. And he said it took them about two years to tell him actually what they wanted him to optimize. And at the end of the day, he said, they wanted as much money going to the government coffers as they could. And so he designed the auction that did that. And then in the UK, all but two mobile phone networks went bust. They had to bid so much into this process to get this spectrum that actually it was really bad. We end up with a, almost a crunch in terms of availability of mobile phone spectrum at this point because he designed it for exactly what they designed it for, but probably wasn't the country's utility. It might have been that politician's utility to get as much money into the coffers so they could avoid wasting taxes. But, uh, you know, getting those utilities out of people can be really, really hard. Um, I've already said finding a maximization there can be quite difficult uh, because it uh, could be a big, complicated decision. And also the statistical part here is often not easy, let's face it. We like to say, we find the distribution and it's all fine. There's a lot of assumptions you need to make to build some of these complicated models. And so then you get into questions of, is that, a, is that a reasonable model you've done your inference under? Do you genuinely have a belief about what the future states of the world is going to be? Uh, and that's where things become interesting. But one, one point on that, actually, before I move on. Um, if you're caring about, which, is your statistical model valid? You know, you can, <laughs> no statistical model is valid. And we've already seen Box was quoted last week, all models are wrong, some models are useful. You can either say this model doesn't actually represent the world, or you can say, actually, but what effect does that have on my decision making? And through this lens of statistics is only so you make good decisions, in some sense, if you can work out that actually among all the plausible models I can consider, I'll make the same decision. It doesn't matter if you've got the right model. You do the same thing anyway. So uh, that's kind of an important thing that is often forgotten in the more theoretical statistics world where you just care about have you made the actual predictions or not. Okay, that is the maths. You'd be glad to hear. Here's an elephant. It doesn't look like an elephant. Does anyone know who this is? Who? It is the DeepMind CEO, yes. So this is Demis Hassabis, uh, one of the first people I met when I went to Cambridge for my undergraduate interview for entry. Uh, slightly terrifying experience. He already, at that point in 1994, ran uh, a hugely successful computer games company and drove around in a red Porsche while being an undergrad at Cambridge University. There was a, even at Cambridge, he was a weird guy. Uh, but uh, incredibly successful, obviously, very driven. He markets things beautifully, doesn't he? Uh, but, uh, he's also achieved some good things, but his marketing is, is really a strong point here. Um, AI. Okay, so I can sit here telling about statistical decision theory. I can tell you how elegant it is and all the rest of it. Most of the world wants you to solve it with AI. Won't AI fix this for us? Um, the answer is sometimes, you know, uh, often we've no idea actually what assumptions are being made when we think about AI. You know, how, do, do we trust what that AI is doing? It seems to give us the right answers most of the time, but it's very black box. Okay, you could sit stats decision theory over here and AI over there. I say, here's our world, what should we do? AI gives you an answer. Do this. Stats decision theory goes, well, here's a reasonable model of the world. You can interrogate that if you want, that's fine. Here's what I think your utilities are. I'll explain what that is, and then here's what I think you should do. And so the explainability coming out from the statistical, most statistical approach to this is hugely advantageous in some situations. Right? Uh, now I'm not saying AI should be ignored. It's clearly very useful. But if I wanted to make an important decision, I would not be just relying on what 
someone else's AI trained on all the junk that's out there on the internet was going to tell me to do. Because, you know, it might well come down to should I imprison this black person? It goes, yes, black people are bad because that's what I read on the internet. You know, so I really don't believe, I don't have any faith in the publicly available AI tools to tell me answers that I can trust. They're going to give me lots of hints that are useful. I'm more than happy to use it to get ideas, but I really don't. I think when it comes to important decisions, we're still a long way off of having trustworthy AI. And so this framework that we're talking about here gives you some way of getting inside and understanding what's going on, I think. But anyway, that, that's my take on AI and the importance of it, yeah. That would be like a good way of understanding utilities. Um, uh, possibly, go on, tell me more. I don't know, just in terms of like flagging so much data you wouldn't think about in terms of thinking about how, how, you know, what are people value, you know what I mean? I think that would be. Okay, so. Yeah, but people have very different utilities, don't they? And so that becomes very, you might get an aggregate utility for the populace, but we all know that populists don't make consistent decisions. So are those decisions at all consistent with the, with the utility function at all? Quite possibly not. Now, interestingly, the psychologists have got a different take on utility to the economists. They don't rely on those axioms, but they still come up with similar things going on. But yeah, uh, Mike goes first. So lots of decision makers make decisions based on information that they don't understand or can't understand that, that like say a politician mm -hmm. is a synthesis report from experts and then makes a decision or a CEO might do the same thing. Yep. So what's the difference who they are? Uh, who, who's just trusting someone? Yeah, okay. No, who doesn't know? Do you, do you think this, like maybe a statistician would be close to the wrong thing? Quite possibly. Yeah, but let's think about that. So if I'm a politician, so let's say I'm the minister for, uh, what's a reasonably uncontentious minister? Uh, I'm not going to say defence, I'm not going to say environment, but yeah, uh, trans minister for transport, good one, thank you. Uh, oh, contentious, well, could be quite contentious, but anyway. Um, so uh, so if I'm minister for transport, right? I've got a set of people who have proved themselves to be knowledgeable and trustworthy in this space. So they have credentials. There's also payback. So those individuals have a utility function. If they fail to provide useful information evidence and they're found out, then they may well suffer personal consequences. Um, none of this is actually true for an AI system providing advice, right? There's no payback on them. They just keep churning out random answers to people. And so the, the, the social structures matter, I think, on, on, the, on, the, on that particular example. Now, I'm not saying that we can get to a point where we can have more faith in our AI systems. Uh, but at the moment, certainly, there's no real documentation of what's going on. There's no real safeguards around about them. Why would they take that liability? They, they seem to be doing okay. <laughs> I mean, in the same sense that you just described, that there would be, like, it, AI is going to come in and back you, right? Someone from like an AI and the reputation. So yes. Yeah. Um, you yep. And I think this is some, one of my major concerns at the moment, actually, is that Demet has su done such a great job of marketing the AIs as solving everything. And then I think they might hit, get a big reputational hit. I think it's plausible that all of formal decision and statistical decision theory, etc. I mean, I've jumped on the bandwagon. Of course, I've called the kind of stuff I do AI because it means you get funded. Uh, but it might all come back to bite us at some point if, it, if it, reality doesn't live up to the hype. Yeah, concerns, Phil. Well, that biases, but I mean, you know, on paper, AI is unbiased. Yeah. Oof. Oh, there, oh, there's a call. <laughs> but you can take the, the, your example of the answer. Yeah. At the end of the day, every one of those people who provide them advice will have inherent price with that. By them, will sell you what you might hear as well. Yeah. And their own politics and persuasion. Yes. Um, so, you, you know, you run a risk in the human world of. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, good point. Um, you would like to think that there are structures in place to try and mitigate those biases. And I certainly wouldn't object to them having an AI query in the room or someone whose only job is to query the AI appropriately to provide that advice back to them. Because let's say the ministers probably aren't going to structure queries well. Um, I don't think it hurts to use it as an input into decision making systems. But I would be taking that as one information source of several 
rather than I'll do what they tell me to do. I know, maybe... Yeah. So the, the point that I used earlier, whether AI in another world to, is to identify from a broader data set, the things you may not think of, you have done yeah. with Arathons. Yes. You know, the, you know, those ministers, it wouldn't have been in their interest, you know, they say they said we want the most money in the government office. Yeah. But it's also not in their interest to best rock, not in the of their industry either. That's not going to be true. But they didn't think of it. I suspect Ken Benmore did think of it and told them and they discounted it. Because Ken would have known what he was doing. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so the, the, you do need to remember that AI largely just interpolates what it's seen before. And so, if you, go on. Of course. At the moment, you put a human in between it and the decision, <laughs> I think, is the honest answer. Uh, and that's, a, that's kind of what I'm getting to, is that, that's a reasonable place to be. I think it's really useful. It aggregates data superbly. Um, whether it extrapolates beyond it is slightly contentious. And it's liable. You know, there's all this kind of hallucinating weird things and, and random things, and it's totally biased. And so getting humans in the loop is, at least for now, I think really important on this stuff. Um, and it certainly doesn't solve everyone's problems. You know, I'm sure you've all had, oh, can you do this with AI? Well, may, might be able to include AI as part of this solution, but it's certainly not going to start from, I want to know whether to do this, yes or no. You've got to do a lot of work to formulate the question carefully and all this kind of stuff. So you still need the humans in the loop making sense of it all anyway. Uh, we did think about it, actually, if this is something with um, a professor in practice in Lancaster who also works with JBA Trust and they're a big insurance consultant. So they consult on floods defense work and flood insurance. And we were thinking, could we use LLMs and related things to really useful construct plausible scenarios of flooding? Uh, and because actually that's really hard. You know, in the UK it's very, very patchy rain, quite a lot of it, but it's not very predictable and could we use okay give us lots of examples of flooding that could happen in this town and then no idea if it would be properly physically constrained or not might be but we could start investigating can we use this to understand uh what actually will flood at the same time as each other because they care about you know normally if, if one house floods the next door one floods as well and so they care about the, the total risk to the insurance company from these kind of things i think that kind of thing is a really good use of these kind of things mike um, a lot of these problems that you're describing seem to relate to what you said before, which is that it can't be the right down for you to be up to in those situations. And that seems to be true to what a statistician does as well, because we tend to provide, like you say, oh, maybe you look at across a bunch of different models and you're the same answer. But the human in the loop is there for the statistics, needs to be there for the statistical, to the statistical situation as well. Right? Like, like all, all of this just kind of running into the same problem you set out. Like, like, that none of the systems you can do with a statistical machine that actually understand people. Yes. Or what? But the important difference here is that only one person I'm aware of has ever claimed to have an automatic statistician. Uh, and that's kind of died a death, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, but many people have claimed that AI will solve all the questions. There's a, there's a, there's a marketing gap here. That, that, that's the thing I'm really concerned about. And I thought, in a mass class such as this, I thought I'd better just bring it up. Anyway, I didn't want to get bogged down too much on AI and Demis. But, uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, let's do that. Mm. Did anyone feel the need for a quick break? Are you all happy to keep on going? Keep on going? Fine, good. Um, so, so far we've been talking almost exclusively about the situation where you get one opportunity to make a decision and you choose the one that maximizes your expected utility there and then. Um, but in lots of scenarios in this world, you get to make decisions repeatedly. So you make a decision today, you then make a decision tomorrow, and then the day after. Now this might be what route you drive to work, it might be what restaurant you go to when you're at a conference each night, it might be uh, when do we offload Prelude, you know, it might be other, other decisions that happen again and again and again. Okay, And we haven't really spoken about that. And the key feature of this is that you can learn from early decisions in order to make better decisions in the future. 
Okay, and so that's what we're going to start looking at now, is how can I take decisions now while being cognizant of the fact that the world's going to repeat in the future. I need to make sure I learn enough information to make better decisions in the future. Because if I don't learn, I'm being a bit stupid here. I'm being an algorithm. I'm not actually coming up with sensible decisions based on what I know. So, uh, Ed has left the room at the wrong moment. Uh, does anybody recognize this place? This is the Kuji Bay Hotel in Kuji in Sydney. Now, this was uh, when I moved out to do my postdoc at UNSW. I moved in around the corner from here. It turned out Ed lived just over the road and had his office just over the corridor. So he dragged me down to Kuji Bay Hotel lots and lots, and I may have dragged him occasionally too. Um, now, the Kuji Bay Hotel has, uh, it didn't look nearly that shiny when we were there. Um, in between the front bar and the back bar, there's an entire room of gaming machines. Like, this is New South Wales, gambling is king. Uh, and there's just this wall of slot machines. You put in your coin. Uh, it doesn't look like that. I think that's Vegas. But anyway, uh, uh, you put your coin in, you press your button, you get some money back or you don't. Uh, and your objective is to, I don't know quite what the objective of that one is. The, the objective is to keep you in the pub so you keep drinking, I imagine. Um, uh, the objective of the person playing the game is to make as much money back as they can for the money they're putting in the slots or more realistically lose as little as possible. Um, now, it turns out this is a classic paradigm of, of decision making. Uh, it's the fundamental base point for reinforcement learning. Um, instead of assuming all those slot machines are identical, which they probably are, but nobody assumes they are when they're in the pub, um, you say, well, let's assume they've each got different distributions of rewards. Okay, so this one might give me an expected reward of five, this one an expected reward of four, that one of six. And so you've got different reward distributions on each of the arms in your, in your trial, if you like. And your objective is to not only... So you need to learn. You don't know what those distributions are when you walk in at the start of the night. Uh, and so you've got to learn as you play which of these uh, slot machines give you a better reward than the others. Okay? So this means you need to both learn in the early phases of the trial, but also make sure you do good things so you don't lose all your money too quickly and you can still spend some on beer. Okay, so this sounds like a really bizarre thing to care about, but let's think about where it really comes into play. Let's start with clinical trials. Okay, in a clinical trial, you might have two or three drugs in a trial, and you want to give them out to patients as they come through the door. You know, do you give this trial, this drug, or this drug, or this drug? And those drugs map to the um, the slot machines in the Kuji Bay Hotel. Okay, so you want to start, you don't know which ones are good and which ones are bad. So you give them a drug. You might as well start with A. And then you see what happens. The next person comes through the door. You give them a different drug. Okay, but through time, you start learning about the effectiveness of these treatments, and you want to start focusing your attentions on the good drugs as the trial goes on, so that actually you treat the patients in the trial as well as just doing the experiment. Now, this isn't classically what's done, but Don Berry is doing a lot of work to try and persuade the industry that this really should be what's being done for ethical reasons. Um, the downside of using this in clinical trials, we have found, is that you end up not seeing enough of the bad drugs, so you can't rule them out permanently at the end of the trial. So you end up having to do some slightly weird contortions to make sure you're ethically giving drugs you believe to be bad to people in the trials. But yeah, that's, that's not my field. Um, it also maps to website experimentation. So this is how I got into this kind of stuff. Um, someone hits a website, the company shows them one of three or four different website landing pages, measures how much you spend on the website, uh, and then has to learn over time which website to show. Alternatively, adverts. Someone hits Google, shows them an advert. I started doing this when Google showed you one advert across the top of the page. It's got more complicated. There's multiple adverts to be chosen now. But you show someone an advert. So Google show the advert. And they, some, you either click in it or don't. So they get a reward or they don't. And then they need to learn through time which adverts are good to show, which adverts are bad to show. Uh, and so I was doing some theoretical work on bandits and, and games. And Chris Bishop from Microsoft came to Bristol and gave a talk on how they were using Bayesian stats and bandits to basically all of their profit now was coming from advertising uh, on websites. And so I was very pleased. And so I thought, oh, this is good. I can jump into this system. Um, recommend the systems. If you're Spotify, I want to recommend good songs for people. Which song is likely to be liked? Netflix. Or well. I want to recommend things to you. You're experimenting while you're taking actions and the value you get. You can't take an experiment that doesn't have an effect. That's really the important thing. And also, you can only observe the effect of the things you show to people. If I never show you Gladiator 2, I'll never know if you liked it or if anyone else liked it. Okay, so the recommender is the same deal. Um, you could also think about this being industrial process variance. Okay, so you've got four ways of doing a job. 
and this job comes up again and again, you know, do you just stick with the one you know? Do you experiment with some of the new ways of doing things? So can, can you trade off this experimentation uh, while doing things to make sure you converge on the best processes through time? Uh, now, let's just experiment with one of these. Okay, I have here some cards. I've stolen them from Ed's house because his kids insist on playing cards with me all night every night. So I've taken these away so they can't be demanded to play spit tonight. Um, I have a red pack and a black pack, and you guys are going to try and play a bandit process here with these packs of cards. Uh, Ed, can you keep score? Because I was thinking that it would be a whiteboard, but listen, your job is to keep score of the total score that appears on red and the total score that appears on black. Yeah, so we'll just take turns to choose one. So Jan, do you want to choose a red card or a black card? Red card, okay. Cut the pack, see what number comes up. Seven. So red's got a seven. So I'm that is a red. Red seven, yeah. Red, red or black? I'm picking a black here. Also a seven. So we've got no information now, right? We don't know which one's better or not. Red's coming up. Five, Ed. Red five. Black one. Okay, so what do we know now? We've seen two cards on each. We've got a seven and a five on red and a seven and a one on black. Okay, so you could now, if you wanted to, stick on red. You think that's good. But you've only seen two cards of each. Red, black. So red, eight. Oh, we're going for black. We're not content. We've seen enough blacks yet. Four. Black four. More blacks. Black four. Cool. Let me come through. Red and black. I'm almost in your lap. Two. Red two. Uh, Ed, what's his total scores here? No, no what's the total score on red? Uh, yeah. 25 on red and on black? Black is uh, 16. Okay, I think we've had one more black than red chosen, have we? No. You, no? Four pop. Four pop, okay. So we're still going black here. Four black. Six red. Oh, Phil's going for the red. Three red. Three black, eight red. Okay, so what are people thinking at the moment? What, what do you think is better out of this? And how, how sure are you? Red, but not by much. Red, but not by much? Is that what other people are thinking? Yeah, that's probably the right thing to do. I think that's the way I set it up. So what I did, yeah, the red, red is the higher pack, but not by much. So I took, I took out... Uh, one set of one to five red, and to get one set of six to ten black. So there's not a big difference, but you could spot it in what fifteen odd trials. And so that's the kind of the way the process works. You need you, you're never sure to begin with, and you've got to keep experimenting. Uh, and so there's all sorts of theory in how to do this. Um, the French, in particular, love their bandit theory. They prove ever more intricate theorems about how it's just above logarithmic regret. We'll get onto that, uh, but. It's also really useful in anything in reinforcement learning. So anything where you need to take actions, sorry if you missed your chance to gamble over there, I do apologize, but uh, um, anything you've got to take actions and observe the rewards only for the action that you take, you need to work out and trade off trying new things with doing what you already think to be best. You know, if, if I had four packs of cards, you'd have to do more exploration to find out what was good, but you still want to focus on the good things and balancing that out is hard. Yeah. There's also an aspect of like, processes that you improve on if you do more often. Right? So like that grinding work, yep. it's like you're, you're going to get more efficient. So so if you try something else, it might actually be better, but you'd be worse because you're, you don't know it as much. Yeah. So yeah. So the, sim the, the reason bandit theory is so popular is because you're allowed to keep to really simple situations <laughs> where you assume you get identical awards each time you do it, but clearly you can start applying those ideas in much more realistic situations. Uh, whether you're going to be able to prove anything or not is another matter. 
And the game in the mathematical world is only, only to look at things you can prove things about, which means it's kind of restricted. Right? And so uh, that's why uh, it's often worth, well, as an academic, okay, I'll be honest here, the challenge in working in realistic versions of these things is that nobody really wants to publish it. Because if you're developing techniques for doing this, then it's not big enough for the engineers, the computer scientists to care about but it's far too dirty for the mathematicians to care about. You get stuck in that limbo in between disciplines and it's really not very helpful. Uh, the way, I don't know how you assess your research in Australia. In the UK, we get assessed by a, a seven yearly assessment panel and you have to submit all of your work to one discipline. So I have to submit everything I do into the maths panel uh, and then some, or choose to submit everything I do into the computer science panel and there's huge chasms in between where work's not well valued. And it's really unhelpful for work at the boundaries between things, but that's a diversion. <laughs> um, so, so that that's bandits. Um, there's a more interesting version of this, which is contextual bandits, and it's always a bit risky putting up your YouTube home screen on on a public screen. Right? But uh, but I carefully screenshotted this in advance. This was honestly the first thing that I hit. I was oh yeah, that's okay. They got me reasonably well. A bit of uh, a bit of funky music, a bit of ski holiday, a bit of cycling, a bit of rugby, and something weird, because it might be interesting to me, but probably isn't. Um, so th that's, that's what it showed for me. Now, that's relevant for me. It's very unlikely to be the best set of things that YouTube could recommend for any of you guys. So how do they do this? Okay, I claim they also use bandit ideas. This is a contextual bandit. What happens here is the system, or the person, knows something about what's going on, you know, they, they know it's me, they know the time of day and where I am, uh, and they know what I've looked at in the past. So that's the context that YouTube has. And then the actions it has is which things should I show, uh, which things should I recommend now, and then the reward is do I click on them and watch them or not, approximately. Okay. Now it turns out they got no clicks out of this one, and they rarely do because I rarely go into YouTube and click something, but that's neither here nor there. They still seem to know who I am, uh, which is slightly concerning. Uh, although quite reassuring that my kids' viewing hasn't affected my YouTube recommendations too much, because that would be even worse. Um, and so in this world, do I manage to converge on the best action is not a sensible question, because there's no single best action. It depends on the context each time. And so this is where we get this concept of regret. And so what this says is, how much worse am I doing so this is how well I've done. You know, I sum over T my utility at time T. And the question is, how much worse is that than the best I could possibly have done? So if I knew in advance the best action I could take for any particular context, this would be the maximum utility I could get out of the system. And regret is the difference between the two. And throughout Bandit World, what you always try to do is bound this regret by either log of t or square root of t or something that is less than linear in t, because that means that your average regret goes to zero through time. And this is kind of the way to converge with these processes. So that's the game we play in the mathematical sense in this world. Um, actually, the, the contextual bandit is really useful. Uh, we've found lots of places where it can work. Anything recommending, anything personalizing makes a difference. Uh, in an engineering sense, I would think, okay, I've got a job to do. Here's what I know about this job. How am I going to do it? And so you could think about learning which best way to do a job that way. Uh, you could, if you really wish to, say, I'm going to look at the the site I want to put an installation in, and then my bandit decision is what type of installation am I going to put on it? But I would hazard that's completely the wrong way to make that kind of decision. Okay? Why? It's because bandits work where you have to take decisions frequently. You, it doesn't really matter if you make a mistake because it's all about learning for the future. Uh, and I would hazard a guess that putting an installation out into the ocean is not the kind of thing you prefer to take a gamble on so you can learn for the future about these contexts. So, so they're, they're relevant in some settings, not in others. Uh, uh, yep. There's an industry context there as well. I mean, we, over time, have converged on certain types of solutions. Yes. So now we see Jacket have a certain foil. Yes. That's essentially... Yes. Yes. The first one might not look like this, and over time they're iterating. Yes. It is very much so. Yes. But then the obvious question to me is: Are you now just sticking with what you know, or are you still doing enough exploration to find the other better ones out there? You know, the world moves on. It's very easy. 
you see this in humans as well, right? As they get old, they get less likely to try new things, in my experience. My parents are driving me nuts. Um, so, you know, you, you, you decide you know what you know. I've done enough exploring. There's not enough benefit to try new things anymore. Even if I find something better, it's not going to give me enough time of something better to be worth it. There's far too much risk in trying new things. It's just going to be painful. I'll stick with what I know. And so from an industry context, is that what's happened with the jackets? Possibly. Uh, but even in that kind of thing, I would say probably where you got opportunities to experiment before you actually deploy the thing out there, right? And so uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's probably not so very different. But um, I guess uh, the, the opportunity has some risk and I guess coming to a change. Yeah. So you know, yeah. what's the real benefit? Maybe the benefit goes back to your S curve. Yeah. So the, the potential benefit of change is not that great. Yeah. The risk could be. Quite yeah. Like they give 5%, but it could cost you 50%. Yeah. And there's a, you know, and if there's enough chance of it costing you 50%, then you, yeah, you can't take that gamble. And so. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So, the, yeah. So, in a wind turbine context, I'd probably suggest a different form might be better. Uh, different, you know, mapping might be better. So, if you are actually a wind turbine controlling yourself and you observe the state of the wind, then you, your action is the configuration you set yourself up in to extract power from that wind. And can you automatically uh, learn as you go the best configuration? Because the cost of having the wrong configuration is you get a bit less power today. It doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, but as long as you're using that to learn how best to configure yourself, off you go. No. I wonder if it's the same. I mean, it's a funny double check, but is it, um, you know, I used to work for FIBO. Yeah. So the big global, I thought they sketch a couple of, and the old adage in industries, you don't get fired for hiring FIBO. Right? <laughs> you know, yeah. Because they're not room, they've done the work. Maybe you could go somewhere else if you go a little bit to a different company and do whatever. Yeah. You never fired. The hiring you go because they have what you use. So over time, obviously, your bandits, you hold in on there, and now suddenly, what's the upside? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you've learned, right? You've learned it through. But, but, so there's your individual utility. Your individual utility is, is best served by going to the safe one. The company's utility might well have been served better by going to someone else. Uh, and so the company might be should have been doing a different bandit approach to kind of make sure they keep experimenting. There's also obviously secondary processes there. If nobody ever goes to anyone other than Foucault, everyone else goes bust. And so um, bigger things going on. Yeah. So for the last three quarters of an hour or thereabouts, I'm going to move on to talking about how you might think about making some of the big decisions instead of m repeatedly making small decisions. And so this is where we're going to start looking a bit more at something called Bayesian optimization and active learning. And this is something some of us in the project have been working on. Uh, and so I thought it would be worth going through some of the basics and some of the stuff here. Um, these slides have very much been given to me by Henry Moss, um, who I did have on the title slide but forgot to mention at the start. Oops. Uh, so Henry was my student. Um, he was meant to be working in natural language processing but decided Bayesian optimization was more interesting. Uh, he came to Melbourne to do some work on Bayesian optimization on string spaces that he's been using to develop molecules. Uh, uh, but he's also developed some really interesting stuff that's more generally useful than that. Uh, and he's actually just moved back to Lancaster and kind of donated me the slides that he's been producing over the last few years. So let's think about trying to build a picture of the world by sequentially experimenting. Okay, And that might be because you genuinely just care about what's the state of the world, or it might be that you want to find the best choice in this parameter space or in the function space. Yeah, I'll come to some concrete examples of what this refers to in a bit. But for now, if you'll forgive me, just some abstract stuff. And so in this world, what we do is we start with some initial data. You always need to start with some beliefs or something. And you can either invent those beliefs or you can take some initial uh, data to start with. Um, you then build a model on the basis of those beliefs. Okay, and they go, well, this is what I believe. I've got lots of uncertainty because I've got very little data. You then go and collect some more data. You rebuild your model. Go and collect some more data, rebuild your model. 
At some point you go, okay, that's good enough. Here's my beliefs about the world. This is the best thing to do. Okay, And so that's the kind of flow chart over here. And then we're seeing that happening on the white hands plot there. So let me see if I can work this pointer. So at the top here, this is the ground truth of the world that we have. Okay, so that's, we've got parameters is on the x-axis and the, va the function values on the y-axis. And we're choosing, we're just trying to learn about this line. What's the shape of this line at the moment? I've given it to you, but imagine you've seen nothing, you've got zero data. Oh, there's a pointer gone. A pointer, don't, uh, pointer a bit dodgy. Okay, so we've got zero data, and so actually we don't know anything. Um, further down this plot, we have a dark blue line and lighter blue confidence bounds. Okay, so that's our current beliefs about the black line given the data that we've seen, and the red crosses are the training points. So to get from the first plot to the second plot, we take 10 random x values, so 8 random points around the x-axis, and measure the function at those points. And that's what the red crosses are showing us. You then fit your function, this is Gaussian processes for those who care, you fit your function through those red points, and you get the blue line. And lots of uncertainty, and we're not very near to the black line. Then get another, 20, another 10 random points, in addition to the 10 we already had build a, a better belief about the function, but look, we've still got big gaps here and here and here that we don't really know what's going on. Another 10 random points. We've still got actually quite a lot of uncertainty in that gap and in here. And we might moment went about here. So we're still not sure about some of the function. And some of this is where it really matters, right? Near these, where the function curves, we're not getting good information. That's very common if you're taking random observations where you have curvature. You need to take more observations so you can find out the shape of the function there than if you, if you, it's a nice flat function. And so the question really goes, this is all very well with random data, but if after your initial data selection, I'd let you choose where to observe the function, would you be able to build a better model of the function for less data? Okay? If you're surveying the ocean, you can start by surveying the ocean bed, let's say, because it doesn't move, because that's a bit easier in this world. You can start by saying I'm going to take a random observation or a grid of the ocean. But then you might do that in a small number of places and you've got a really noisy picture down there. You can then just add more grid points or more random samples. Or you can actually choose where to look next to try and build an, a, a better picture of the ocean floor where you care about it. Or, you know, so there's lots of examples like that that repeated building a model and selecting observation points can really save you time looking where you don't need to do it. Here's an example of doing this. Uh, I think it's simulated, to be honest. Uh, but here is malaria incidents in Nigeria, okay? So you want to know where, uh, where is malaria happening at the moment in Nigeria. And this is the ground truth that we've taken as given. So I think that was probably true data coming from somewhere. We then took a random sample of points in Nigeria and observed is a malaria or isn't there in this location, and then built a spatial model on the basis of that to get the best prediction as to where, uh, uh, where malaria is present. And then we said, actually, if we th then allow ourselves to choose where to look on the basis of the beliefs we already have, we can really pin down much more accurately the shape of the instance of, mal of malaria by just being very careful. You know, you've done lots of sampling worrying about the boundaries between the, the infected areas and the non-infected areas. So the active uh, selection of data really helps you build the model because in large parts of the space there's not much going on. You see up here, it hasn't done much sampling in the northwest because it's just learned quite quickly, actually, there's no malaria up here, I don't need to find anything out. Uh, whereas over here, uh, there's lots going on, so it's put lots of data. So, you know, by actually selecting your data, you can get quite a long way. That's active learning, just selecting data to build the best models you can. And then closely related to this, and this is much more common actually, is Bayesian optimization. And so this is all about trying to maximize a function with as few observations as possible. And where does this come in? Well, the reason this is suddenly popular again is that this is how you tune your big machine learning models these days, the deep learning models, is You've got a set of hyperparameters for your model. It could be structural. How many layers of my neural net do I have? How big are they, etc. It could be 
your learning rates and your regularization parameters. It could be how long to keep training for. So you've got lots of things you need to give your training procedure in order to train on data. So you give it some parameters and then goes away and does its thing and trains and back props and blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, it gives you a number. Ping, we've got 0.73 accuracy or whatever, whatever system you're using. Yeah? Um, and what you want to do is be able to choose your training parameters, your, your configuration parameters, to get the best possible performance at the end. But of course, each time you choose a, you choose a parameter, you've got to train the whole neural net. That's hard. It takes days. And so to be able to choose your parameters well, you need to be able to do so without choosing, without doing a grid search over parameter space. You can't do a grid search in this world. It's far too big and complicated. But you can select a small number of these things and try them out. And that's what Bayesian optimization does best. So consider this, just for the sake of argument, that this is some parameter in your neural net training procedure. Yeah, normally it's multidimensional or whatnot, but you can't plot that well on the screen. So we've got um, a parameter here, and here's your performance. And you've got several peaks of performance through the parameter space. Uh, if you used a hill climbing algorithm, first of all, you'd have to do far too many observations, but you'd also get stuck in one of the four maxima. And Bayesian optimization is always about finding the best point. And so can we find the fact that this function is maximized about 0.45 with as few observations as possible? That's the name of the game. So let's do it. Let's start by taking five random observations from this function. So now the game is all I can do is put in a parameter value and measure observation. I don't know the shape of the function around about it. I don't know any gradients. I can just measure the value of the function of where I try something out. So I've tried five x values and observed the function here. And I want to go, OK, where do I need to look next to try and find the maximum? What should I do? What would you do? So we know the function's reasonably low over here. We know it's kind of high in the middle, and we don't know anything much over here yet. And so the game is try and choose what to do. Sorry, there's been a bit of moving up and down going on here. We've got the same five points, you know, in blue crosses, and I've fitted the Gaussian process through it. Okay, so essentially, I've drawn a line and said, right, if I'm nowhere near where I've observed something, then I've got high uncertainty as to what the function value is. And so I guess most of you have seen these at some point. Uh, and now you get some idea of, oh, okay, if I want to find good points, well, the function value here could be anything between, you know, whatever this is, minus 1.5 and positive 1.5. The function value over here, I'm pretty sure, is only between minus 1 and 0. So there's no point in looking more over here if I'm trying to find the maximum. In the middle, well, I don't know quite what the high point is, but all the values are quite good, so it might well be worth looking there. And how can we formalize that is the question. How can we formalize this decision-making process of where is it worth looking? Uh, and this makes sense in both Bayesian optimization, but also in experimental design. It's the, the act of learning we had before. Where is it worth looking next is the key question. Kind of like in the bandits, you know, where is it worth trying to experiment next? Or should I just do what I know already? Um, so obviously fitting an arbitrary function with a Gaussian process is a bit of a call. You know, you're putting some assumptions on your function that it's continuous, that it behaves in nice ways, but we've got pretty good faith these things are able to capture most of these functions quite well. So that's relatively uncontentious, usually. Um, although the dirty secret of all of this is actually fitting your Gaussian process as well is actually the guts of much of these things. The actual nice stuff, the elegant stuff that Henry and I have done on top of it, that's the, that's the pretty boy stuff. The hard yards are done in fitting Gaussian process well, uh, and so that, I'll leave that to Ed. <laughs> um, so... Same plot, but move to the side. Uh, the way we do this is um, we build something called an acquisition function. So if you've got a Gaussian process beliefs about the value of your function in various places, you can say, okay, I'm going to push that through a functional that changes that into a, an acquisition function and says, what's my expected value of choosing this point in the context of the problem I'm trying to solve? Okay. How much do I learn about the problem by selecting this particular value of x? That's what the acquisition function tells you. And so it depends what you're trying to solve. If you're trying to find the maximum of your function, how useful is observing this point in terms of finding the maximum value of the function? 
if you care about learning about the whole function, how useful is this point in terms of learning about the whole function? And it depends on your beliefs already, and you've encoded your beliefs in that Gaussian process that you've fitted to the observations you already have. So, uh, there's two of the, <laughs> whenever you put up Bayesian optimization, you need to give these two acquisition functions. They're not cutting edge at all, and we're going to move on to a better one soon. But probability of improvement says, okay, actually, I'm not going to bother thinking ahead as to, is this going to help me find the maximum long term? I just want to maximize the probability of finding something on the next turn better than anything I've seen before. So that's this probability of improvement function. What's the probability that fx that I'm going to look at is bigger than f star, the best thing I've seen so far, given what I know? It's rubbish. Never deploy this one. It just doesn't work. Uh, it selects points close to the maximum you've already seen, because a Gaussian process is either increasing or decreasing. And you, so all you do is choose one side or the other of the observation you've just made. And so that's really not a good thing to be doing. Um, but it was what was done for quite a while, and God knows how the field took off doing it. Um, a more useful one that does work annoyingly well is expected improvement. What's the expected gain that I'm going to make uh, if I choose this x value? Now that works because if you've got very low uncertainty about your function, so you're near to a point you've already made, then actually, you know, because Gaussian processes are smooth, you're very unlikely to make a big improvement and so your expected improvement is small, and so you end up choosing elsewhere. And so what do we mean by improvement as such? So the, the blue line, dash blue line is the current best solution, and then we're looking at what's the gap between that and what we think we might get, really. So the, look at what, which part of the Gaussian process uncertainty is above the blue dashed line. It's not quite accurate, that doesn't follow through, but it gives you good intuition for what you're looking for when you're looking at the expected improvement. Uh, and it, and the red line here is the expected improvement for choosing different places. So we can see over at the left-hand side, the expected improvement is zero. We don't really don't expect to see any improvement over what we've already seen, given what's going on. Uh, over the right-hand side, well, yeah, there's a good chance we'll get something better, but actually the expectation isn't too high because the, the mean prediction is going down a bit, and we get a really good expected improvement in the middle there. And so what you do is you maximize the acquisition function, so I choose this x, then add it into my loop, and go again. And so there's a loop where you, you build beliefs, you construct your acquisition function, you maximize that, you choose your x, and then you construct your beliefs again. I think that's coming on there. Yeah, there we go. This is kind of describing how it works. So you start with your initial data, you construct your acquisition function and maximize it. You observe an observation at the x you select. You update your data and you go in that loop. Phil. I mean, a lot of this is relegated on that and on, on your original Gaussian process. Yes. The less, you, you know what that was, that background, you, you created a, a model right. that that's guided us in a more complex environment. Like you go back to your Nigerian, yep. you know, I lived in Nigeria, I got that. Right? <laughs> Were you on the purple spots? <laughs> uh, if you had that model, you know, you, you know, you'd be using it as a way just to predict whether to pick your dogs. What you, if your prior view on the model is to drive you to then not even look in some areas. Possible. It, it's essentially now that there's a reinforcement thing going on here, isn't it? So okay, yeah. So, you, se you, yeah. Se several facets you, of that, yeah. The original model and it's reinforcing that. Yeah. It's really looking in the areas where it's probably being reinforced. Yeah. So there's, yeah, se yeah, yeah. So several aspects of that. One is that the prior we used to build it in that example was a completely flat Gaussian process prior that didn't tell us anything about the model. So, uh, so yeah, m knowledge prior knowledge was negligible. The first five data points gave us pretty much all of it. Uh, on your disease mapping, you we would generally try and avoid putting our own models into a situation where there are already models there. So the, the epidemiologists have pretty accurate models and are based on Gaussian processes of where these things are, and they're all spatial stats models that can be kind of, you know, dirty secret, they're all quite closely related. So you can turn your, your kind of more traditional spatial stats module and a Gaussian process model without too much pain. Um, and then would you never look somewhere? Okay, so this is something that's hardly spoken about, actually. So 
Whenever we do Gaussian processes, we assume almost always that the power mean is flat zero. Now, actually, in a explore exploit world, that's a bad idea. And this is an old idea coming out from reinforcement learning, is you should take optimistic priors, although actually in your Nigerian case, probably not optimistic, pessimistic. But, uh, you know, there's a significant probability of something happening there. Uh, and so if I've not seen it, I assume it's there. And so if you start to get good ideas in, in other bits of the space, you still haven't explored here, but you think there's a good chance it's there. So then you're going to explore. So optimistic kind of high side priors, if you like, will help you to make sure you don't never go somewhere. Uh, and then the other thing that we've got so far is that we assume there is one fixed function we're maximizing. Now, of course, the big thing about diseases is that they move. And so the question is, can we start building models that would use this well in a world where you've got an evolving function through time? And the answer is yes, and the answer is way. Uh, but that's kind of a, no, no pressure way. Uh, and so that's what's going on. Okay, so... Uh, yeah. When do you stop this deal? That's a really good question as well. Uh, when when the paper submission deadline comes in is your answer. <laughs> um, uh, well, so you do at all points have a belief about the function. Okay. So when you are comfortable that the decision you're going to make has got a very high chance of being above some threshold of regret on the basis of your beliefs about the function, that's a good time to stop. You know, each experiment costs money. Uh, it, it, we can put it all in times of money, right? Um, this, the red curve could be the value of the thing you're going to do. Now, if you are very confident that you're going to be within $10 of the maximum here, there's no point in spending $10 in another experiment. And so you can use your beliefs on the Gaussian process to inform you about when it's time to stop. Uh, whether or not the Gaussian process is an accurate model of what's going on out there, that's another question. But yeah, so you do get some information here, more than some others. Oh, he's coming back for more. Yeah. My own PhD student gave me grief in my master class. Go on, Ray. <laughs> um, in certain settings, the search space is quite fit and no, yes. you just has to one up, but it wasn't front so and the front the studio. Yes. It is not sometimes as easy to choose a sensible search. Yes. So, then, so how would you view that? Well, wow, so you would hopefully know the set of things that you could choose. Yeah. So that is your search domain. The set of all things I could take a choice over, that's my domain. Uh, and then you need to work out how to build the Gaussian process over that domain. And that was some of the hard work that Henry did when he wanted to do strings. So he, the reason he wanted strings is, is, a, is a language in use to describe molecules, particularly for pharmaceuticals. That is, you just write down a string of letters and that turn, translates into a chemical formula and that trans, translates into a, a usage, a, a functional property. And he was trying to work out how to build a kernel between strings, which largely means you need to have a distance between strings, and distances between strings can be really hard. But um, Daniel Beck at Melbourne, I think, had developed ways of calculating distances between strings really efficiently. And so then you can build a Gaussian process on the basis of those distances. And then the challenge only became how do we optimize across the space of strings? And so actually had, he had a genetic algorithm in the guts of optimizing the acquisition function in order to be able to select a good string called an acquisition function to go and then try in a molecule. So that's a bit I didn't get to talk about yet, is, you know, optimizing a function on every loop. So you've got to find the maximum of this acquisition function every loop. If it's the unit interval, that's easy. If it's the space of all strings, it's hard. Uh, if it's difficult to... Yeah, so, so the first thing is... We all design these acquisition functions so that they're easier to optimize than the original problem. The original problem, taking an evaluation is really hard. It's like training a full machine learning model or it's synthesizing a molecule and testing it. Okay, so it's expensive. And you can only observe the thing that you choose. We normally design these acquisition functions to be differentiable, reasonably quick to optimize, but it does take time. So this is only useful in a world where actually taking real measurements is expensive. I think that's the world we live in in tight, mainly. But that's, uh, that's good for me. Uh, uh, and then optimizing it can be quite hard, but it's always done in, com in computers, in silico, instead of in the real world. And so that's uh, why there's a viable thing to do. But you do need to trade off the savings in terms of observations. Is that justified in terms of the cost of the optimizations I need to do on the way through? Um, it's a deal, great. And you don't really fun. But you end all the sector. 
Yeah. It's not that I've either bought it in the ass company and had made more profit, you know, for a year. I can be, you know, my regrets are very different to if I'm a wind farm company and there's no margin and the decisions have to be right. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, you know, or sort of, yeah, how far do you go? Yeah, you know, that's Quite possibly, yeah. yeah. Um, but actually the optimization cost is wanting, paying someone to run the optimization for you and paying the altruism of the computer. So relatively cheaper to do. But yeah, in terms of how many experiments am I prepared to do before I make a decision, that yeah, maybe comes into it a bit more. Uh, but of course, experimenting costs money too, and time, and it's, uh, it's all a trade-off. So these are two rather dissociated images I just hoiked out from anywhere um, to give you some idea of what you might imagine you might want to do. Uh, so this is a, a wind farm, believe it or not, quite close to Lancaster. And the weather doesn't often look like that where I live, but they found a good day uh, somewhere. Um, this is, I think, the second biggest wind farm in the world, just off the west coast of England. Uh, and they've got to build lots of wind turbines. Now, if you want to build a wind turbine, you need to find somewhere to plonk the thing on the seabed. And there are many people here who know a lot more about this than me. I'm pretty sure this image has got nothing to do with the seabed. But you might think about it as taking measurements of the seabed and then trying to find the hardest bit or the dark blue or something. So I, I very much doubt you can take that many measurements in the seabed before you put a wind turbine down. But anyway, uh, you get the idea. It's, it seems to have started with a reasonably well-spread grid, and then it's learned where the seabed is not good for putting things, and it started experimenting in this harder triangle here to find good things and found the best over time. So that, that's the kind of world you could imagine um, uh, being useful in this sort of world is citing something, because each measurement you know, with, oh, where the, the ground probes to measure the hardness through the ground, each measurement's expensive, right? So why not, once we've measured one of them, go and work out the absolute best next place to take it, instead of just carrying on regardless, plugging these things into the ground on a grid. If you've got enough data to know that this portion of the seabed isn't worth looking at anymore, stop looking at it. But if you've got a fixed design, you can't do that. You've got to keep doing them all. And so I think there's scope for doing this kind of thing. Okay, so here's what happens. This is now a minimization. I told Henry about three weeks into his PhD, he should do it all either maximization or minimization, but he's now started flipping around maximization, minimization, and cause of confusion. So we're now trying to find the minimum of this function. The true objective function is a black uh, dot dashed line. And we started with four observations. I say, okay, I've built the Gaussian process on that, the blue one. And I've calculated my acquisition function, which is the red one. So my next choice point is at 0.86 or whatever it is here. So then you measure at 0.86 and you get quite a high number because the function's going up. You then build your new beliefs again, calculate your acquisition function and choose to look at about 0.75. You come over here, you've now got actually quite a good belief about your, your uh, true function. You calculate this acquisition function and choose to look here just to try and narrow down some of the uncertainty here. And yes, it narrows down the uncertainty. We don't learn much more about the mean. You then, by this point, you've realized, to be honest, guys, somewhere down here is by far the most likely to be the optimum. So I'm now going to look here. And you find very close to the optimum. It involves it five uh, extra observations or something. So that, that's the way this works. It doesn't always work in five observations. In <laughs> fact, that, that's a particularly special one. But that's kind of how the Bayesian optimization works too. Okay. I've already been waffling on about this for a while, but why should we care about it? So the first thing is it does global optimization, not gradient descent. So if you're doing gradient descent or gradient descent, you just find local maxima and minima. Bayesian optimization explicitly looks for the very best, uh, which is kind of important in some of these things, I think. Um, it's really best when you've got limited evaluation budget, okay, where taking a measurement is expensive. So you put the work into working out where to look not into looking. Uh, so you might. So we're doing work at the moment, simulating um, the Tesco supply chain. So Tesco, the big supermarket in the UK, and we want to know, okay, where should we be setting our uh, logistics chain uh, to be able to optimize that? And you can run a simulation of that and kind of or parts of it in, in a matter of minutes. Um, you train a large machine learning model, measure that several time hours, uh, molecules, or weeks. You know, you could even think about taking this into engineering design. You know, let's design a, build a prototype and test it. Uh, and then you're on months of timescales, and that's hard. And the other key thing 
is black box. You don't need gradients. You just need to be able to measure the function and you can measure the function with noise and all, it all just follows through in the same way as before. So these are good things to do. Another thing which isn't on this slide but should be is that there's loads of code out there for just doing this now. Uh, there, were, there were several competing packages for a while but people seem to have largely converged on using Bowtorch um, which is the meta released code. It's good. It's got lots of examples in it. It's really easy to deploy. You just wrap it round about whatever you're trying to do and say, okay, I'm going to give you 10 opportunities to find the best parameterization of your, of your procedure. Uh, give it a go. It's really easy to, to try experiment with like that. So uh, worth experimenting with. Here's some cool things that largely Henry has done, to be honest. Um, so oh, he didn't do the AlphaGo, but I already mentioned AlphaGo was used to, um, it, it was used to fine tune AlphaGo. Uh, Henry did this one though, um, helping Amazon Alexa to learn new voices. And so there's some parameters of that system. And what it does, it, it kind of tweaks those parameters, tries them. They ask a human, does that sound like this person? They go yes or no, or gives it a score. And then it tries again. Uh, I suspect this is the one that they made, might have used was it Amazon who got hammered for doing an exact copy of uh, Scarlett Johansson? Uh, it was opening, opening eye, okay, so maybe they used what Amazon already knew how to do. But uh, I suspect it was that as opposed to an exact copy. Um, and also finding molecules. Uh, we think that's quite a cool application thing. And then large climate models, so we're going to talk about that next. And there's a reference to a really good book that's out there. Um, Garnet's book is, is well worth a read if you're interested in some of this stuff. So let's have a quick think about model calibration. Okay, and this is relevant to some of the conversations I've had this week. Lucky. Uh, Should I go back a slide? Sorry. Should I go back a slide? Yeah, no, this is why I was going to be like that this question. So when it comes to calibration or designing an engineering system or something like that, often there's lots of extra delays that's not necessarily just represented in the observations. Mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, when we we know that we kind of want to be skewed towards a range of the parameter space. Mm -hmm. That that whole thing could be overcome by data. How easy is it to vault in those forms of beliefs into your acquisition functions? Not thought about that. Let's. So, your beliefs are entirely encoded in your Gaussian process. Okay, and so you might well, before you start put a prior when you go in process that says these regions of the space will will have high scores and these regions of the space will have low scores. And then you can take some observations and try and confirm that. You would risk that confirmation bias we spoke about before because you said a priori I believe these bits of the space to be bad. You'd have to make sure your covariance allowed you to have beliefs out there that were reasonably good. You would also have to make sure that your prior mean was on the same scale as the actual returned performance when you ran the experiment. So the experiment returns numbers on a 0, 1 scale and you're coding your beliefs on a 0, 10 scale, then they're not going to be compatible and it's all going to be a bit crazy. Well, in fact, you want to say that the data inside of all pieces of that thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, couldn't you just walk the link to studies of what is it you said, for example, the S is 0 to 1 and yeah. 1 else? That's going to give you wiggly stuff where you care about it, not quietly. No, there's, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I actually don't cover that in this slide, but that's fine. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, yeah. Lots of yeah. Yes, quite. Best avoided. Um, <laughs> so uh, it blew my mind when I went to chat to some of the climate scientists in Lancaster and realized actually they, they tune their models by just tweaking knobs until it looks okay. Uh, it, was, it seemed, are you serious? Is that actually what you're doing? But actually that is what they're doing. They're, they're saying, okay, we've got all sorts of programs in there. We, we have beliefs about these things and we're going to play around and oh, look, these simulations look okay. We'll run with those ones. Um, so they, they, they run the model, they compare various summaries with observed summaries, and off they go. And of course, each one of the climate models is mega expensive. And so this is ripe for optimizing better than hand tuning. 
which is exactly why the machine learners went and said, okay, we can't tune a deep learning models by hand anymore. We need to use Bayesian optimization. So how does this look? Ah, uh, so what we need to do is find parameters. So let's say every parameter of the climate model is, a, is encoded in a vector theta. Um, and we want to find, you know, high plausibility of the data. Uh, we can't get lots of evaluations. This is exactly what a Bayes opt is for. Uh, we also don't have gradients. Uh, and I said only limited prior knowledge. Um, so a black box problem. You could, of course, put more prior into the, the GP prior, as Lockheed pointed out. And so, it's, again, just an example of how you might do this. You start with initial design. I'm going to you know, put my parameters on a grid, a very coarse grid, just so I get some sense of the shape of this function. And then we're going to measure the plausibility of my climate uh, model at each of these grid points. And you do that, and then you can fit your performance across this region of parameter space. Say, well, where is it implausible and where is it not? So that's stage one of the, guess, of the Bayesian optimization. I've done these nine points. I think that's what is going on here. You then say, okay, that's great. There's my beliefs. Uh, I'm now going to choose another set of evaluations to look at. Uh, these are the first selected set of evaluations you like. These are the places I think is worth looking to get more information because I'm trying to find the best. And so the distinction of what's happening before here is that we're choosing several points at once, batch, uh, which is an added complication, but very doable in the kind of world we're in. And then you get a second world, and then you focus all your final sets of things on that most plausible ridge. And in the end, you're going to select, okay, this is the, the, the set of parameters I believe most likely for my for this model, given the data that I'm trying to fit it to. Uh, as this is kind of adaptive calibration of this model, if you like, um, what it's not going to give you is a nice sample from a posterior of parameter values given the observations, okay? Because you, you're very carefully selecting the thetas to be as good as possible, given what you know, and to give you as much information as possible. So you do get into the problems of preferential sampling for those who care about it in this kind of world, because you're very actively selecting your observation points on the basis of the thing you're trying to find out about. And so you, you get some challenges in terms of the inference you might want to carry out. But if you just want to find the best parameter, this is a really good way to do it. Okay, here's a set of... Yeah, go on. I think that's the way to do these things, yeah. So these are things like the... Uh, yeah, I haven't done this in detail again. But it would be things like, what's the uh, energy transfer of this type of thing to this type of thing? Is that sort of scale of climate model that's sort of going on? Um, but there's no reason why it couldn't be something more dynamic like what you've been looking at. Um, I don't know. How, you, you've got a set of parameters in your model, about 10 or so. And that what we're talking about is upstairs. That's the kind of thing you could plausibly optimize this over. Um, but it's only going to give you the using this technique is only going to give you the best set of parameters, not what's a set of plausible parameters. And that's a slightly different question. Now, you, of course, you have this model at the end, which tells you, okay, what's the plausibility of each parameter in my whole unit square? But I'm not entirely sure I'm convinced by that Gaussian process fit because of this issue of selecting points very carefully to on, on certain regions that you previously thought were good you might not have particularly good inference away from the points you observed. So here's other cool things that um, Bayesian optimization can help you about. Um, batches, I just kind of gave you a very informal introduction to batches. If you want to select 10 points at once to be as useful as possible to, for your task, we can do that. We just have to hack around a bit. Um, uh, Multi-fidelity. Okay, so this is something Henry worked on in his thesis. We'll get to that in a second, I think if we've got enough time. Uh, so sometimes you might have uh, cheap models, expensive models, and reality. And if you're trying to find the best thing to do in reality, it's well worth trying to optimize your models first. But you might want to choose when you want to go and look at different things. And you might want to make sure you learn the relationship between your models and reality. So at the beginning of the process, you might well use your cheap and dirty model to get a rough feel for the shape of the process. 
then when you've got some shape, you might want to jump to the next model and hone in on the really good areas a bit more, make sure that that more expensive model aligns quite nicely with the cheaper model. You might want to jump back and forward a bit. And then when you've got the pretty good idea, you might then start doing one or two expensive real-world experiments. But choosing when to do these things, you can do that automatically using this sort of framework of just making sure you do it to maximize your information gain or something. Uh, as opposed to saying, well, we'll definitely do 30 cheap experiments and 10 expensive ones, and then we'll, we'll, we can try three final dwelling positions. Uh, that's where this can balance out automatically. Yeah, that's what I earlier conversation. Yes. Yeah, we do not, though. Yeah. When is it worth simulating another storm? That's the kind of thing we might well be able to think about. Yeah. Um, cost aware, you know, some measurements are more expensive than others. Sometimes it costs money to get from one place to the next to take another measurement or do an experiment. Um, you might be transition constrained. You know, if you're taking measurements in the ocean, so ways looking at where do you drop drifters in the ocean, you can only move your boat so fast and it costs money to do so. So, can we take that into account when we're deciding where to drop these things in the ocean? Of course, it applies to many other things as well. I was doing an exam the PhD thesis a couple of weeks ago where they were looking at chemical experiments and you could only change your experiment by so much from one measurement to the next. And so you've got to take that into account when you're doing these things. So lots of things you can bring into the framework. Some of them are more natural than others to bring in, but it's a, it's a framework that lets you develop new experiments quite effectively. So, ooh. Now, should I stop five minutes early as well as starting five minutes late? Mm. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I mentioned a word that time that um, I said information. Get as much information as you can about the maximum or about the function you care about. And that's not something we've really sp spoken about. You'll, you know, if you're on top of this stuff, you'll have noticed that things like expected improvement, probability of improvement, they don't actually explicitly target the thing you care about. They just give you some heuristic for choosing a point. And so we realize this, and they also don't work well in quite a few of these examples over here. If you do multi-fidelity or batches, expected improvement really doesn't hang very well at all. So we, we started thinking more generally and said, what do we want to do? We want to find the maximum, maximum of a function, and we've got beliefs about that function, uh, how can we maximally find information about that? And so then he said, well, I to, what's the distribution of that maximum given the data that we already have? What does that actually mean? Well, here we have the red and the oranges as they have been for the past many slides. The green line is now a sample of that Gaussian process. Sampled on a grid, but it looks like a line here because that's where Gaussian processes work. And then the blue bar is the maximum of that green sampled function. So that is one sample from the distribution of the maximum of the Gaussian process given the data. So we can do that 10 times, and we get a histogram of samples from that. We can do it 100 times, we can do it 1,000 times, and this gives us the distribution of x star given the data. So one thing you can do is something called Thompson sampling, that's something I did a bit of work on, although not in this context, where you select your next point by sampling from this distribution. And that's a perfectly valid thing to do. It seems to work quite well. Um, not very well, though. So uh, we don't actually do that. Um, but we've got that distribution. And really what you want to do is maximally reduce your uncertainty in that distribution. You want to know where the maximum is. So you want to make this distribution as certain as possible by getting more data. Uh, and so Henning and Schuler, they're not on this one. Anyway, so they came up with this thing called entropy search, where you just say, what is how do I maximally reduce this uncertainty as measured by entropy? Now, if you don't know what entropy is, let's not go there now. I've got five minutes left. But you maximally reduce the entropy in the uh, location of the maximum. And it's really hard. It's a bit of a nightmare, especially if your search space is at all high dimensional, like three. Uh, and so it didn't really take off in a big way. But it works really well. So the, the performance of these things are the, the, the colorful lines at the bottom, and that's the regret, I think. So how much, how badly are we doing compared to the maximum? How much worse is my best found point than the maximum possible point? And these curves, are you sort of the regret's going down towards zero. I don't quite know what the scale on the y-axis is there. I must ask Henry one day. 
this is in, in the vein of all machine learning plots and that you show a plot where your curve is the best and then you move on. So uh, you'll have to forgive me on that one. Um, you can turn it the other way around. So this is more recent. This is Takeno uh, et al. Uh, uh, oh, Wang and Jigelka introduced this one. They said, well, instead of reducing the entropy on the location of the maximum, let's reduce the entropy on the value of the maximum. There's some relationship between the two. It's not perfect, but this is always a one-dimensional quantity. Okay, because there's the value of the function. So it's always in one dimension. So you can always approximate that easily numerically. And that's really the insight here. And so this is the max value of entropy search function that you can do. Uh, you know, again, the equations are unhelpful here. Um, and it turns out this works really well. So this is max value of entropy search. So the, the overhead is quite small and the regret is something. Um, expected improvements, the yellow one up there. Um, I don't know what all these other knowledge gradient is something that pops up in this world. It's got huge computational cost and isn't very useful. Um, and then Henry came up with this other version called Gibbon, which is an approximation to max value entropy search that does batches and noisiness and different fatalities and non-Euclidean search spaces. And it's turned out to be really useful. It's quite a cool day when you sat in your office and the engineers from Facebook call up and say, would you mind helping us getting this into a Bowtorch framework? You go, hey, that's quite cool. Yeah, I'll do that one. Uh, in fact, I won't tell St. Henry to do that one. Um, so that was basically the, the core of his thesis work was developing this one. And it works really well. That's the message I want to give you. Um, but, you know, in summary of the whole thing, right? So uncertainty is a pain in the neck. You know, it may well have been the case in your experience that you go to the statistician and they kind of tell you what you already knew, but with more uncertainty. All right? And that, that's kind of what we felt we've done in stats departments of ages. Nobody wants to come and ask us because we just tell them they don't know the answer yet, and they thought they did. Um, but actually, if you're trying to use it to make decisions, then having a handle on your uncertainty is really important, and it can really help you to make useful decisions, especially if you're making sequential decisions, because you need to know where you don't know things, so you know where to look, so you can know things better. And that's where this measure of uncertainty is really useful. Uh, and the other thing I, I'd really like it here is that Bayesian optimization is really deployable and really useful. It really is just a wrap around whatever code you have. If you're coding in Python, it's a matter of three or four lines around about it to give it a go. And it might do you nothing, but if you give it a go with three lines of code, what have you really lost? And so uh, it's worth experimenting with. Um, we've been quite structure-free and model-free, right? I've just given you data and posited a very generic Gaussian process on it. Um, quite a lot of the work that Henry and, and Wei are going to be doing over the next while is trying to get a bit more structure into there. You know, what can we use about what we believe about the world to make sure it makes sense? Um, there's questions as to whether that comes into the modeling or the acquisition functions or both. Um, probably the modeling, but, you know, that's, that's kind of the world the direction we're moving in now because being completely black box means you throw away some information so you're more, uh, you're more wasteful if you don't use what you know, which coming come back to what Lockie was saying earlier about we know the plans are in this bit of a space or we know the ocean behaves like this, you know, or physics constrained worlds, can we incorporate them? And if you can build them into your Gaussian process modeling or some other stochastic model, so all you really need to build the acquisition function is some model that gives you a mean and a variance across a whole space. Once you've got that, you can build the acquisition function on top of it. And so everything I've been speaking about today is Gaussian processes because they're relatively quick and easy compared to some of the other things you might do. But it might well be that you get even bigger gains if you use more appropriate stochastic models of the world. Um, that's it. I'm, I can't believe I've timed it to within a minute of two hours, but <laughs> thank you all. Thanks, You're welcome. Any questions? Yeah. I have one question. Um, interpolation versus extrapolation. Yes. Where's the role? A lot of what you've talked about today is feeding models and interpolating between data mm -hmm. and, and the role of data like and that. But a lot of what they are also started to look about an extrapolation into the variance or climate, breaking mm -hmm. down with extrapolation. Does it have the same role, same opportunity, or does the uncertainty noise start to blow up into the big other lake? Yeah, it depends how good your model is, isn't it? If you're extrapolating outside of where you've seen, you have to be relying on beliefs about how things will change outside of what you've seen based on some other evidence from somewhere. And if you've got really good models and beliefs that don't 
expand your uncertainty too quickly, it's plausible. But if your uncertainty expands like this, as soon as you move out from what you've seen, what can you say? Everything gets lost in the noise. And so, uh, and then you really, you then, but then how do you validate those models if you've hardly seen anything out there? And this is the question that we were chatting about this morning, Jan, is if you've just not seen anything, how can you have any faith as to what is right and what's not? Um, I just to be absolutely clear, Jan doesn't believe she doesn't know anything about the world, <laughs> just in case she comes back at me on this one. But you know, there, was, there was a particular situation where we, we could not say we would have seen something. And so then we've no way of validating whether or not our model is accurate. I wonder whether, you know, you looked at some of, it seems like five million. Yep. It's a pop, pop million, yeah. You wonder whether um, some of that uncertainty, the fact that it goes up, it, it makes it very difficult to make decisions. So you see governments unable to make decisions or reach consensus or doing things. Yep. Because we're extrapolating and things are yeah. blowing up. So that, that comes down to some extent, though, to... If you would make the same decision for every conceivable extrapolation that you have come up with, then make that decision, even though you don't know actually what the prediction is. You know, I think, uh, okay, so I hang around with lefty climate scientists quite a lot in Lancaster, uh, and their take on it is very much that under any of the plausible futures, we're in the shits. <laughs> so, so we better do something about it damn quick, uh, is their take on it. And they, they're more than happy to say, Actually, we really don't know what's going to happen, but we know that all of the outcomes are likely to be bad. Uh, and in fact, many people in stats, to some extent, including me, have stopped doing statistical work in this area because there's no point in getting slightly better. We, we kind of accept the limits of how accurate we can be in our predictions and even we make them more accurate than they currently are. It's not going to change the situation out there. Yeah, we know the range is that, might get it down to that, and it's all above 1.5. And so, so there's no point in doing more stats. It's a political problem, is, is our take on it. Uh, you know, the, the, the pure decision theory says, do it. Uh, the, the, pol the politics and the, you know, why, why should we pay for it, uh, says, don't. Any so. others? Go on. The global optimization plug. Mm -hmm. Is there a theory behind that? There is actually, for some versions of it. Um, so upper confidence bound and Thompson sampling have some theory on it. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's how you, that's how the proof happens is essentially if you leave this going long enough, you will try everywhere. And so therefore it reaches a gold lot of them. Um, there are, yeah, the theory is a bit light on this stuff. Yeah. It's lighter than you would like it to be, but that's because so this comes back to my work in Contextual Bandits. We had great difficulty getting that stuff published back in the day because other people were proving more impressive looking things in much more restricted scenarios. And my instinct has always been to work on the scenario that matters and prove what you can. Uh, but the, the theorist's instinct is work on what you can prove and then hope it's vaguely relevant. And so I, I've despite looking like quite a theoretician at times, my instinct has always been to work on the actual problems, but the actual problems are much less amenable to proof. So, yeah. uh, sorry, this is a dumb question for all the statisticians. They're like, so I understand what Bayesian optimization is, but like, what is Bayesian? <laughs> so, there's very little Bayesian about Bayesian optimization. Yeah, that's, that, that's one thing. That's a, so I think it's called Bayesian optimization because it's using the Bayesian framework of, of Gaussian processes. So you have a belief, you then update it on the basis of evidence, and then you get new beliefs. So essentially that is what Bayesian means. Uh, is you use a formal machinery to work out what your new beliefs should be on the basis of what you believed before you saw it, and then the new observations. Uh, um, the kind of classical Bayesian statisticians always talk about prior beliefs, observations, and posterior beliefs. I do my best to avoid that language, actually, because I always think about it as, what's my current belief? Then I've observed data, then what's my new belief? But it's not prior and posterior because the next decision is using the posterior as a prior and you tie yourself in knots if you think like that. So you should always think in terms of belief distributions given data. And that's my take on it, but it's very much my take. Uh, yeah, it's just formal, formally incorporating your evidence into a probabilistic belief structure. I use just the blog here. Hey, Sparks. Another question I'm the difference between personal utility and company. How do you how do you experience business? Partners that have tried to 
Norman Reitz have or Rubenstein? No, I haven't. But I bet Ariel Rubenstein has. He did some work in companies. He's an Israeli guy, and he was working in an Israeli factory, and they had problems with non-compliance with safety procedures or something in the factory floor. And he worked out very carefully with them that actually, if it used to be that they got severe fines if they breached any safety protocol. And all that meant was that everybody hid it and nobody wanted to dob in their mates because they were, you know, didn't want to get them sacked or cost them a fortune or whatever. And so he came back and said, actually, these guys' utility is not yours. These guys care about being safe, but also not dobbing their mates. And so let's find something which incentivizes them to be safe and incentivizes safeness. And we accept that is not the company's utility, but it is these guys. And so what he said was they set up a structure where if you mentioned something that was unsafe, then you get a small bonus, five or something. I mean, really token. And they got a, a very small fine or it got ticked off and got marked on a sheet, something inconsequential in the short term. And suddenly the safety culture changed massively because it was, okay, you're helping your mates stay safe. You get a minor bonus for doing it. And they get a minor penalty for, for not doing it. It doesn't affect their life. But actually now we're all much safer. And realizing that different utilities was really important than that. So I, th- I suspect he's done a fair bit more thinking about that. But I haven't been in touch with him for 10 years. <laughs> I don't, no, I just don't. Uh, I just read something as well as like, there's also the, the, the monetary value you can also backfire in mm-hmm. terms of if you like put monetary value on uh, flying or not flying or something. Yeah. It's almost like removing the moral. It does, yeah. And so, yeah, I, did, I don't know exactly how he did it, but he's, He's good at thinking about exactly this. He's a psychologist and economist across that boundary, and he's really very good at these kind of things. So. Well, I think we've got some blood chat there. Oh, yeah. Other questions going out there. Just say these. Yeah. So I'm waiting for the rest of today and for tomorrow. So if anyone wants to come back to me and ask anything, you know, general or detailed or anything else, just give me a shout. Ed will always know where to find me. So good. Thank you all. <laughs>